I'd like to welcome you back here for another Bible study on Job. Um, if I know we took a few days off here for uh, the holiday weekend, uh, but where we left off, uh, we were in the middle of a Bible study where we were trusting God's plan and not our own, but as you can see here, what does Scripture say about our relationship with God in the midst of suffering. And so we took just a little bit of an exit from the book of Joel, but these verses, I would tell you every single one of them are connected to what Job was experiencing. And then often, of course, what we and God's people throughout the ages have experienced, okay? And then what's our relationship with God in the midst of those struggles? And I would tell you these verses provide a lot of perspective and not just perspective, but a hopeful perspective because of who our God is. All right, so uh, I'm gonna take you down to the bottom of the first page and we're gonna take a look at a couple verses from Romans. Um, Romans chapter eight, specifically starting in verses 18, 18 through 20. And in those verses, what I'm going to uh, suggest that you see ahead of time is in the midst of your troubles, have a heavenly perspective. Okay, again, I'm going to say that again. In the midst of your troubles, have a heavenly perspective. All right. So Romans 8, uh, 18 to 20. Apostle Paul wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. All right, now I want you to think about this for a second. He's basically saying no matter how bad things are now, no matter where our suffering level is at, is your suffering level at a 10, an eight? Where where is it exactly? No matter how high it is, it's not worth even comparing to the glory that is gonna be in Paul says revealed in us. And he's talking about when Jesus returns. That right now to the naked eye, I mean, you can remember Job, his friends took one look at him and just started crying when they saw his level of suffering. To the naked eye, you look, okay, uh, things are going really bad with that person, but to the unseen eye, to the eyes of faith, that person is held by God and the grace of God given in baptism that person holds to God in faith. And when Jesus comes again, the glory, the joy, the amazement of then the gift of being in God and having eternal life is going to be revealed and seen with the eyes once and for all. In other words, what Paul is talking about here is in the midst of suffering, having a heavenly perspective. I consider our present sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And he continues, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to the frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage and decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. That verse is talking about all of creation. Remember last week we looked at Genesis chapter three. And you remember, and this is, this is absolutely perfect for this time of the year too, I've got to say this. It wasn't just Adam and Eve who bore the curse of sin. But remember, it was all the earth. Uh, thorns and thistles as you work the ground. So as gardening season begins, uh, we do our seasonal battle against weeds. Thank you, Adam and Eve. In other words, though, all of creation, not just people, but even this planet and the, and the difficulties that come when there's all kinds of disasters, natural disasters, we call them. But even that is waiting, subjected to frustration, according to this translation. But when Jesus Christ returns, all of that is gone as well, okay? The old creation is new again because all of sin and its curse is gone. Keep a heavenly perspective, okay? This isn't the end of all things. God has something beautiful in store. 
In fact, this is how Paul finally put it. These are some famous verses of Scripture. Scripture. We're still in Romans 8. And if you have your Bible study with you, uh, some of you may have printed it out. If you flip the page over, some of you might just have it on your computer. In which case, scroll down. All right. The next thing, Romans 8, same chapter of Scripture. Paul is in the midst of talking about suffering. Okay. And then he gets to the end and says, no. In all these things, and he means bad things. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whatever's happening. And there are a lot of bad things that happen. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God, specifically, that is shown in Christ Jesus. Now, where is Paul's perspective? It's looking at Jesus, specifically Jesus, on the cross, that he would lay down his life in, in our place. Look at the extent of God's love. And then, based on that, Paul says to us, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. He came and in great love conquered sin and every evil and every temptation and even conquered death itself. How can we not be conquerors as well? Because through faith, we take hold of Christ and all that he has done for us. That, in other words, his victory is our victory as well. So in the midst of these terrible things, Paul actually confesses, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. There's conquerors, and then there's us. We're actually above conquerors. I don't know what this is, but we're more than the conquerors down here, through him who loved us. All right, so have a heavenly perspective in the midst of the trouble. By the way, Job did. Um, one of the famous verses of, of um, I should say, one of the famous hymns in our hymnal is, I know that my Redeemer lives, what comfort this sweet sentence gives. Well, that hymn comes specifically from Job chapter 19, where Job actually, in the midst of the trouble, says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And then he talks about, even though, you know, my flesh and body bones decay, even then, he says, in my flesh... I will see God. There's a heavenly perspective that he keeps. All right. Romans uh, is, we're going to move past that on to Matthew. Something that happens to us in the midst of trouble. Uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, which you will eat or drink, or about your body, which you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Now, it starts out with Jesus saying, don't worry, which is one of the worst sermons that could ever possibly be preached. Uh, you know, you're going through a real problem, real struggle. Uh, could be financial, could be health, something like that. And a friend is with you and says, eh, don't worry. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I had never thought about that. Thank you for your help and advice. But you have to listen how Jesus continues. Verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Here you have Jesus then pointing us to other parts of the creation, even just the birds. You know, if God's taking care of these birds, what about you to whom he has given life and breath and a soul? In other words, Jesus is giving an object lesson here for us to just take a moment, look outside of ourselves, because so often worry, we get consumed with the things that are going on on the inside. And he directs us here outside. Look at the care that God gives through his creation. Do you think he forgot about you? Do you think that you don't matter? Not at all. 
Those are those temptations to despair. And then he says, how much more valuable are you than they? And just to have that in a heart and mind, part of the part of the sermon, that worry that looks in, look out to all that God does and look specifically then, of course, to him. All right, then we have another part here. I'm going to clump together here the next three verses because they go together because I'm going to talk about a specific type of suffering and that is suffering because you are a Christian. All right, suffering because you are a Christian. All right, so I'm going to take you to 1 Peter 4, and I put 13 through 13. That's good. Uh, that doesn't make sense on the page. So we're just going to say it somewhere around 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13-ish. All right, but here we go. Oh, it must be 12 and 13, actually. Peter wrote, Dear friends, and he's talking to Christians now, talking specifically to Christians, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But, re in, but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. All right, so there's a lot here. The Christians throughout the ages have been persecuted. They've, they've suffered for being Christians to this very age. Um, across the globe, there's many places where Christians are... Uh, uh, bound, uh, uh, tortured, churches are burned down, you, you name it, displaced. Um, if you remember when ISIS came to its height just a couple years ago, uh, the Christians were treated uh, just absolutely brutally. Um, in many places, uh, candidly at the hands of uh, uh, a radical militant form of Islam, uh, that's happening in places uh, really across the, across the globe. Now, um, and also, I should say, under the hand of communism is another, another big one that's, that's taking place. But at the same time, uh, Christians just individually here in our country, um, uh, if you want to be a, a, a counselor and you want to counsel from a Christian perspective, there are some students that have been kicked out of uh, universities and the programs for doing such a thing. Um, if you try to speak your Christian faith, a lot of times, like in school, you talk to some of the kids, uh, they're pretty sure they're going to be suspended. Um, these sorts of things on an on a individual level. I know um, in my former parish, there was a, a girl who had a Christian t-shirt from our actual church, uh, and she was told that she couldn't wear that t-shirt to church or to school. Um, and it was a pretty mild uh, t-shirt at that. All right, now, what's being said here? Peter says, dear friends, don't be surprised by this. And then he says, it's come to test you. And what's that point of a test but to reveal, to strengthen, okay? Not to harm. It's not what a test is intended for. And then he says, as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, have the perspective that this has been the path first for Christ and then for all of God's people throughout all the years. This isn't strange. This is normal. This is what we are to expect in a world with sin that is set to rebel against God. Well, of course, if you're walking one way with God and the world is going the other way, well, you're swimming upstream. You're a stranger in a strange land. Don't be surprised when this comes your way, all right? And then it's not just don't be, be, be surprised, but then rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice in sufferings? Yeah, because if this is the way that Christ went and this is what Christ experienced, it means that you're on the right path if you're suffering for his name. Now, I wanna be clear about this. This is not suffering because you are a jerk. So if people are mean to you because you were mean to them first, that's not suffering for Christ. <laughs> we're talking about a suffering that comes because you're actually displaying and living your Christian life. That's what we're talking about here. And he says, rejoice in this, that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed, that is, when he returns. That is to say that on that day, you will be shown to have his victory in full. People will see this. 
Same thing here, John 16, 33. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, and he's talking about, again, specifically trouble for being a Christian. All right. All right. We're not talking about random things that happen. We're talking about a specific form of suffering here. And then he says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And we might think, well, that's great that you've overcome the world, but what about me? But the whole point is, again, his victory is our victory, okay? That everything he did is given to us in our baptism and kept by faith. We have all this in Jesus. Same thing here, Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. Wrong one, back it up. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, people, uh, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Again, not because you're a jerk, but because of me, meaning that it's known that you're following him. And then he says in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, again, this is a big lesson, and I teach this very intentionally to our, our teens as well, in our, our preteens. It's such a radical message that has to be embraced. Blessed are you when people insult you. Rejoice and be glad. Yes, I was mocked and disliked today. It's awesome. Well, of course, this sounds absolutely nutty. And I want to make a distinction between having joy and rejoicing and being happy. I may not be happy on the inside that somebody mocked me or persecuted me because I'm a Christian. Okay? But I rejoice. Nothing can touch joy. Happiness is an emotion that comes and goes, but joy is something that lasts always. It's always there because of Christ. And he tells us something. Hey, number one, you're on the way to heaven. And if things are going like difficult in a difficult manner, things are tough for you as a Christian, you're on the right path. You're going the way you should be going. To, to feel the pressure and the intensity from the world, that's a good sign for your Christian life. As opposed to, hey, if I'm cool with everything going on in the world and the world is cool uh, uh, with me, that may not be a good sign for my life and my relationship with God in the midst of suffering. All right. So you take a look at Jesus. Rejoice and be glad. Great is your word in heaven. Hey, the same way they persecuted the prophets. Now we're going back to the Old Testament before you. All right. So take a look at that again, the different perspectives in the midst of suffering. That's suffering during your Christian life for being a Christian. All right. That being said, when we come back here on Friday, we're just going to finish off this page and then we're going to go back to the book of Job and we're going to get to the grand finale of the book um, and what Job has to say after God, how shall we say, lovingly corrected him. All right, so I'll see you back here on Friday for another fun-filled, action-packed episode of Job. God's peace.